Hi, my name is Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. Today I'm talking to Aid, who is a farmer in the outback in Australia and he has some very interesting uh, observations of his area where he has seen uh, phenomena similar to those observed in Histalin of bull lightning. So, hey, tell us a bit about yourself, how you came to be there and the first time you saw this phenomena. Uh, hello, uh, Bob, and hello to uh, the viewers. Uh, my name's Aid. Uh, I'm a uh, farmer and uh, volunteer at the National Park, uh, uh, you know, locally to the farm here. And uh, for many years uh, here, we've been seeing uh, ball lights or ball lightning, and uh, it's a fascinating subject. And, uh, you know, we're going to get stuck into it uh, now. Okay, so um, can you describe the first time you, you saw one of these uh, ball lightning? Yeah, okay. Um, the first time I saw one was uh, 25 years ago. And uh, when I saw that, it was only a single light. I was on top of... Uh, uh, one of the high hills on, on our farm. We have a very elevated, uh, uh, you know, uh, area. And uh, I was sitting in the dark on top of a hill and all of a sudden about uh, what I would describe as uh, less than a mile in front of me at, at eye level, um, an orange light just appeared out of nowhere and it stayed absolutely stationary. It didn't, uh, as, as an orange, a, a glowing orange ball light it didn't move or um, change intensity after one minute uh, it just flashed and disappeared and uh, from that time I started looking around uh, uh, I, I started seeing more of them I started talking to the local farmers who've been here longer than we have and uh, to my delight uh, the farmers have been seeing them for decades and uh, you know, uh, yeah, I, I, I was hooked on this phenomena. So, um, can you give us a description of you know um, maybe how frequently uh, you and other people in your community see these things? Yeah, okay. Um, we do see them all year round, uh, but what we've managed to work out, we believe, is that during and, and either side of the peak of the sunspot cycle, uh, they're more prevalent. Um, now, and, and, and during those periods, the best times we see them are from, and this is the Southern Hemisphere, guys. So in the Southern Hemisphere, um, you know, April to September is winter. Uh, so we see them mostly in large numbers during that period of time. Uh, but we do see them in summer, but we only see them in groups of maybe one or two or three. And the interesting thing, as we'll get on to later, the ones we see in summer are normally further away and, and they don't seem to be as bright, intense orange. They seem to be a more red or red orange. And they're always far away on the horizon, whereas most of them that we see and experience, including my experiences, um, you know, we can be three or four hundred yards, uh, you know, three or four hundred metres away from them and they, they're flying around illuminating the ground. Um, you know, to some people that might sound incredible and amazing, but it, it really has been happening like that here for, for many years. Uh, so when yeah. you say illuminating the ground, um, it, it, uh, what kind of time of day are we seeing these? And uh, because obviously, obviously if it's in the middle of the day, there's less chance of it illuminating the ground. So what, what time of days are you normally seeing these? Well, OK, um, there's, a, there's an old adage that says nothing that happens at night doesn't happen during the day. But there's absolutely no... Uh, evidence or witness testimony that says anything like this is happening during the day. Now, when they are frequent or infrequent, they are mostly seen uh, from about 7 p.m. to about midnight, uh, with the bulk of that between 8 p.m. and 10 p.m. Sometimes they're seen in the morning before the sun comes up. But when they're seen that early, it's only ones or twos. Um, when they're prevalent, uh, you know, they can be 
in in groups of four or six, and 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 uh, we'll get onto their behaviour later. But um, the greatest amount that uh, myself and two witnesses. Uh, we were all together at the time. We counted 72 in wow. four hours. Wow. And you asked, you asked how close they are. Sometimes they can be three or 400 metres. Uh, there can be three or four of them, three or 400 metres away and coming and circling around us uh, and illuminating the ground because these things are big enough to illuminate the ground. Um, uh, the the night that we counted 72 in uh, three or four hours, that was in a two-week block when uh, seeing 20 uh, in an evening was easy. Uh, I mean, most of them we're talking about a, a fiery orange ball that, that has various behaviours. So mostly orange, these orange lights, um, pretty much like the, the ones that are seen in Hector. Okay, so um, when you're saying the peak time is in the winter between 8 and 10, um, are we talking uh, from dusk onwards? No, they don't, they don't appear at dusk. They appear well after dark, uh, which, uh, you know, absolutely eliminates, you know, any kind of sceptic that says, you know, it's reflection off a helicopter, a weather balloon, or uh, something like that. Uh, they're absolutely nothing like that. Okay. And can you uh, describe the, the variation uh, in scales of them, the actual physical size? You know, are they a couple of metres? Are they tens of metres? How big are they? Yeah, okay. Um, when they have been incredibly close, as in three, four hundred metres away mm -hmm. uh, or, or closer, um, we estimate the size uh, of the orange. Now, you've got to understand that when there's three or four of them that close, there's so much light that, you know, you can't tell exactly how big. But I would say for the majority of close encounters that we've had, 10 to 30 metres across would be about right. Okay, 10 to 30 metres. And uh, are they... Um... Do they do they uh, tend to stay on their own, or uh, do multiple form at the, the same time and interact? What, what, what is the sort of uh, you, you said? There's multiple sometimes that can appear. Um, are they appearing at the same time? Do they divide? Do they join? Can you describe the sort of behaviour of clustering that might be going yeah. on? Okay, so so clustering is a part of it. Um, the variations in behaviour. Uh, in other words, how they're acting and interacting is, uh, you know, infinite. Um, you know, we just have to basically go through it step by step and say, well, sometimes they appear in a linear line. Sometimes um, you can have three or four of them uh, over to the left, maybe a kilometre away, and everyone's concentrating on them and, like, looking, oh, my God, look at the amazing light, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then some, you know, two miles in the opposite direction, one big one will just appear and stay on for a couple of minutes. Um, so that, I think that's a good introduction to your question because I'd, I'd like to talk about many more of the behaviours because they are kind of, they're kind of incredible and bizarre at the same time. So do, do, do they form lines? Do they form uh, geometric shapes like triangles or rectangles or, uh, you know, what kind of shapes do they form and do the shapes uh, persist and do the shapes that are formed travel as well as staying relative to each other at a similar distance? The answer uh, uh, to, to those questions is, okay, so if we take uh, shapes, um, triangular shapes, I couldn't say for sure they were equilateral, but often you'll see a triangular shape um, and, uh, you know, like an isosceles triangle. Uh, sometimes you see a rectangle. Um, sometimes the lights come together. Sometimes they, uh, you know, come together and go out. Sometimes they come together and then four more will explode. You know, or it could be six or three, you know, um, they they uh, sometimes act in a linear way where they'll uh, be like a pulsing light along a, a line in the sky. 
Uh, and that line doesn't have to be level. It can be down towards Earth or it could be up towards, well, the, the sky. I mean, they're in the sky, but... Yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, pointing further so, up. <laughs> yeah. Which so, way is up? <laughs> um, you know, so sometimes they leave a streak across the sky yeah. and sometimes they don't. Sometimes they just come on and go out. Sometimes, I mean, this was the most crazy thing. One day we actually saw two go together and I'm going to use simple language to describe this, but I don't want anyone to think that there's more to this than a natural phenomenon because I believe it's a natural phenomenon. But two of them came together and the little baby one dropped out and went down onto the ground. And everyone who saw it went, oh, look, it's dropped a baby. And I'm, <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh, this is the stuff that Hollywood talks about, you know, <laughs> in their movies, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, so lots of linear. I mean, I think the most common uh, form that we see is where a light will come on and it will then go out and then it, it seems to come back on at a preset distance. And some of the preset, some of the distances between when the lights come on are very equal. It's very interesting. Right. They're very equal. There's a lot of geometry to this, um, and that's what I, th why I think some people who see them can't help but think this is not natural because, you know, they seem to do things which an intelligent, uh, uh, you know, being would, would do, um, but I don't think it's anything to do with that. I think it's natural. So um, w when you're over sort of four units and you're not in a, a linear uh, uh, grouping, um, how yeah. do the multiple, uh, um, like seven or eight or whatever, how, how do they arrange themselves? Yep. Okay. Um, you might be, because normally when, when they're out, everyone rings each other up and we all go out on the hills because we all live up on hills up very high here. Um, we'll go out and uh, three will appear uh, maybe a kilometre or, or, or maybe five kilometres uh, to the left and there'll be three lights and they'll be just random uh, with no particular shape. And then you might get uh, over to the right um, a, a mile, uh, you might get six of them that will come on and three of them will go out and three of them stay on. It's, it's every kind of combination of going on and going off and move it that you can create with with a computer. They, they do everything, and it's bizarre. Um, so you're saying on and off. Would you describe it as blinking, like you've got something coming here and it's going on, off, on, off, on, off, that kind of thing? Uh, or would you say like there's, there's yes. two and you've got on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off, like that, or multiple in that fashion? Well, using the linear uh, example, uh, it's whether it's one – see, we don't know whether it's one light or multiple lights, but when they happen in a line, it goes on and then it goes off and then it, the light comes on uh, a distance, you know, along the line. Uh, the distances vary, um, you know, but they definitely seem to be uh, or appear to be uh, – a, a uh, the same distance between them um, you know sometimes you'll get a light come on and it will actually move while it's illuminated like you know you you know across the sky and it'll leave a bit of a trace or your eye may be interpreting that uh, I'm open to suggestion on that but uh, so yeah sometimes they go on and off as they move uh, and sometimes they will move actually while they're illuminated Okay, so have you um, uh, seen any interactions with, say, treetops or other solid bodies in the environment? Yeah, I know you mentioned okay. one going to the ground, but... Uh... Yeah, okay, so um, uh, long story short, I went outside one night around 10 p.m. and I looked to my northwest, which is actually towards the highest peak in this area, uh, which is on, on our farm. And there was a huge orange glow. And this was during a period of uh, heightened activity. And so I, gr I ran inside and I grabbed my digital camera and I took off in my car, in my, in my four-wheel drive truck. And I uh, took the road, uh, the track that goes through the hills, and uh, I 
turned the camera on and I had it ready. And as I came over the crest of the first hill, I could see that in the second valley there's a huge glow. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm finally going to get a photo of this thing, you know. And so I'm, I'm going pretty quick through the bush here uh, on this bush track. And I, I, I crested the second hill. And as I came over it, the, the glow in the valley was um, what I would describe as a couple of hundred metres across in, in, you know, in light, illuminating, you know, you know uh, uh, area. And I slammed my brakes on. My camera was already on. I clicked um, to take the photograph, and the light just vanished. So it it stayed on the ground. This giant orange burning light stayed on the ground from the moment I saw it to what would have been three or four minutes for me to drive like crazy, um, you know, uh, to get to. Now, was there any burning? No. Was there any sensation? No. Um, there was no treetops because uh, it's a very forested area, very thickly forested uh, area we're, we're talking about here. Uh, no damage to trees um, and nothing untoward. And that's the same as when I've been uh, uh, having them fly around me uh, and illuminating the ground I'm standing on. You know, I mean, I've pointed laser pointers at them that didn't appear to do anything. I've shone spotlights at them. That doesn't do anything. You know, they seem to be 10 to 30 metres across and producing a hell of a lot of light, but there is no feeling. You, uh, you know, uh, there's no hair standing on, uh, standing up on my, my skin. My skin isn't wrinkling. I'm not scared at all. It's just quiet and it's dark. Uh, other than the lights, of course. Yeah, so um, you, you mentioned that uh, it occurs in the evening. Um, can you give me some idea yes. of the temperature differential between the daytime in those winter days and between the yeah. 8 and 10 in the evening? Yeah, okay. Um, so in the uh, on the continent of Australia, uh, being in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, so that's winter, right, um, the daytime temperatures here um, uh, are sunny. Uh, sorry, my apologies. I'll start again. The the weather is normally sunny because uh, winter is the dry season, and so the days are normally, assuming it's not raining or uh, or it's windy or something, they're normally around 19 degrees centigrade. Okay, so by the time that they turn up, which is mostly eight p.m. to 10 p.m., the temperature has usually dropped somewhere between 0 and uh, 8 degrees. And normally, I would say, around the 4 degrees and 3 degrees. Uh, we noticed over the years, when we see them the most, uh, it is uh, in when, when it's quite cold. Uh, I mean, we can get minus 5, minus 10 Celsius here, but... Uh, you know, plus five is still pretty cold. So you, you've got yeah. a uh, temperature swing, uh, potentially, uh, in some ground areas, and maybe as it's elevated, you, you, you've got a, maybe a degree temperature drop per 100 metres. So you, you may have areas yes. on the mountains that are always swinging between above uh, freezing point and below freezing point during those times of uh, peak observations. Uh, yes, that's that's right. Um, so the the mean temperature difference, I guess, would be the difference between nineteen and maybe say just on average three or four degrees centigrade. Okay. So that's uh, sixteen degrees. And being the dry season, uh, winter, the humidity is very very low. Okay, very, very low. There's a couple of interesting things there. Um, obviously, uh, three to four degrees is when water is as is is at its minimum scale. Obviously, when it freezes, it gets bigger again. So above four degrees, it's bigger, and, and, and below four degrees, below four degrees, it's bigger. Um, and so yeah. the three to four degrees is very interesting from a, a physical um, stress point of view. The the other thing that I need to ask now is is um, obviously the dry uh, environment is very very important uh, as far as my understanding is, and we can talk about that later. Um, so, do you see uh, any cloud cover at these times? Um, we have 
because this is obviously a natural phenomenon that I'm inter- that you know has spiked my curiosity, we started looking for patterns, and we noticed that the moon phase doesn't matter, and if it's cloudy, it doesn't matter. If it is cloudy, they're underneath the clouds, you know, uh, because we are up quite high. Sometimes the clouds are in the top of our hills, you know, where we are. But uh, the lights are always, uh, the, the ball lights or ball lightning, as, as you call them, um, mostly they're less than 5,000 feet in, uh, above the ground. And normally they are well, well within 2,000 feet of the ground. Uh, and you've described them coming sense. all the way down to the ground. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, sometimes um, when uh, this is one of the things because um, for, for you know for some viewers who may not realise that with parallax, um, you see something and you don't know because of the human brain's connection to the eyes, you don't know how far away it is, and you think, well, maybe the thing I saw was in you know space. You know, maybe it was a supernova that was billions of light years away. Well, when you've got hills and the thing is lower than the next peak behind it, you you damn well know the distance and you can damn well find, you know, figure out the size of them too. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the thing is the human can't generally judge distance uh, without other visual cues beyond about 20 metres. So uh, uh, having mm. those hills around, which also they have in Histalin as well, you can, uh, and the clouds uh, have probably uh, some level of which they can reach maximum uh, different types of clouds. Um, you can ga- gauge, you know, scale and, and, and location in terms of distance and height above the ground within some reasonable understanding is basically what you're saying, yeah? Yeah, the, the, the only difference that we've noticed or, or one notice, noticeable difference is that in summer, uh, the lights are very few, but when we do see them, they're usually very far away. Now, this is in stark contrast to the idea that 99% of these lights are within about 15 miles radius of my farm my farm being the highest point in this elevated area. When we see them in summer, they seem to be a much more orange, uh, sorry, uh, reddish colour, and they are always on the distant horizon. And that is an interesting thing to think about because we're used to seeing them. We can look, I mean, we can look, when we stand on a hill here, we can look down into a valley and see these lights, or we can look up into the sky and see these lights, and we can tell how far away they are if there's a hill behind it. But in summer, they always seem on the far distant horizon, and you know, like they're 20 miles away. And it only comes in groups of one or two, and they never do cool geometric patterns and and behave like they do uh, when they're when they're very active. So, um, can you just, uh, for context, give us an idea of what the humidity, uh, the the weather patterns, and the temperature night to day is during the summer periods? Oh, in summer, okay. Um, uh, well, I really should rely on the average. And um, excuse me if I just don't give you the exact statistic, um, but. Um, in December and January, when it's the hottest here, uh, the daytime can be, on average, 34, and the night times are around, if you're lucky, uh, 15 or 16. But sometimes the the peak, the peak in summer can be, I think, last year or the year before we had 46 degrees, uh, you know, uh, one day for a couple of hours. Uh, and then sometimes, you know, you can you can uh, a hot day can be followed by a cold night, as is per any desert, uh, you know, that experiences uh, huge fluctuations in its temperature range. So, what would you say? Yeah, I, I mean, I mean, I've been in a, a desert where it's been forty-five in the day, and it's been, you know, you need a, a very thick sleeping bag at night. So, what are we talking yeah. about for the for the cold parts in those days? Um, the coldest day. 
well, okay, the coldest day ever recorded here. Uh, we've been here on this farm for 50 years. Um, the coldest day was five degrees in December, but that is not um, uh, that's five degrees Celsius. That's not normal. Sorry, was um, that in the, the day average... or the night? Uh, sorry, Bob, say again. Was that in the day or the night? Uh, that was during the day. Okay. That was during the day. So I'm interested uh, in the coldest because... night temperatures. Okay, in summer, the coldest the night can genuinely probably ever get down to is probably. I would say in the middle of summer, probably around the coldest it would get would be 10 degrees, not much colder, mm -hmm. not much colder than that in the night time, mm -hmm. uh, but often um, uh, 12 or 14, yes, mm -hmm. yeah. in the night, in summer, yes. And you are saying that you're at 700 metres above sea level. How much further up yes. does the mountains go? Um, 800 metres. So you're near the top. Yes. Correct. Okay. So you, you've got a potential for another degree or so drop in that extra height there. Uh, uh, yes. In, in general. Okay. So uh, that's very interesting. So then, um, I guess the next question would be: um, uh, What is the geology in the region? You know, what sort of uh, um, do do you have uh, uh, metals? Do you have uh, um, magnetic materials do you do you have quartz like materials what, what's the kind of geology okay um this is something that is of interest to me because um i uh, went to a english grammar school and i did earth science um for five years and uh so i do have a i must confess i have a, an interest so we are sitting where we are uh and this mountain range that i live on is sitting on predominantly basalt. Now, the interesting thing is that just to the east, only 10 miles to the east, is the edge of what's called the granite belt. And it's predominantly granite and uh, the variations of igneous rock that is like granite. I mean, obviously, you have all the different kinds of granite, right? So we're sitting just on basalt. So we are on basalt fully. But just to the east of us is a massive uh, granite area that is uh, that goes for uh, 100 kilometres in any direction. So on where we are, where it's basalt, we have, first of all, I'll just say uh, a little bit of extra background before I get to the minerals. Um, we do have um, poor quality um, shallow uh, coal under here and we also sit on ultimately under the basalt on a huge limestone intrusion under that now what do we have here as far as metals is concerned 20 kilometers to my west southwest there is a silver mine it is a full-time uh seven day a week 24 hour a day silver mine they obviously mostly get silver uh, they get a little bit of gold, but they basically make their money from silver. Um, there is tin here naturally. Um, there is uh, high quantities of arsenic, which is probably irrelevant. Um, so mostly silver, a little bit of gold, tin. Uh, I'm trying to think of anything else. Not really. There's not really any copper or lead here. Um, mostly silver. Uh, and there's scratchings where, where where the explorers 100 or 150 years ago, they, they, they'd sink a shaft um, exploring, you know, this whole area is full of mine shafts. And um, so that, that sort of uh, is the metallurgy uh, side of it, uh, which is interesting. Oh, and also we have a lot of milky quartz. And okay. the interesting thing about this area, um, you know, because you know, I live here, uh, I, sometimes I forget to say things. And so there's a hell of a lot of milky quartz mixed in with the basalt. But here's the interesting part. All around the world, people associate quartz with gold. And in this area, the milky quartz has no gold in it at all. 
right, which right. is interesting because when I was a kid, we used to go searching and we were always disappointed. Yeah. So that's about the extent of the metallurgy uh, in this area. Okay. And also so, to the north, yeah. uh, 20 well, miles to the north, there is an ex-gold mine, an okay. ex-gold mine 20 miles to the north. So um, yeah. you're talking to me on some form of uh, internet connection. Can I ask how that is? Is it is it wired? Is it satellite? What what is it? Yeah, um, uh, out here because we live in a remote uh, part of Australia, um, where the mobile phone doesn't work, we get uh, government sponsored uh, satellite uh, broadband internet, uh, which is um, not the world's fastest, but it's twenty five megabytes a second. <laughs> okay, that's not bad. Yeah. Um, and and uh, how many people would everyone have that there? Uh, yeah, most of the farmers around here have have that. Yeah. Um, when yeah. was that introduced? Um, the first satellite uh, connections uh, just over ten years ago. Okay. Uh, we were on a uh, satellite that belonged to the toy government uh, to start with but now we are on an australian government satellite that actually they installed themselves okay and and would you say there's been any difference in the uh, uh, prevalence of these uh, ball lightning since 10 years um difference in the prevalence well the the difference in prevalence uh from what we can figure out is like i said with the um the peak of the sunspot cycle. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's for sure, but we're pretty sure that because we've kept notes. Well, what, what I'm trying to say is you, you saw the first one 25 years ago. Uh, yeah. Has there been any extra in the last 10 years? Oh, God, yeah. Um, uh, yes. Oh, God, yeah. Um, um, yeah, the increase. Look, Bob, thank you for asking that question. That is a very good question because the answer is actually yes. They are increasing. They are increasing in number, yes. Okay, that's interesting because uh, uh, Kapitza, who uh, was a very famous Russian sci scientist and actually some other scientists have proposed different models for ball lightning, but uh, mm. they suggest that they can be stimulated and... Um, uh, uh, and uh, fed energy uh, by um, uh, microwave energy and in fact uh, one of the experiments that we are currently um, building to at the moment is using microwaves uh, from a standard magnetron in a resonant cavity which is here and uh, we have these quartz uh, vessels uh, which uh, go into the reactor and we put to the kind of material that you will get uh, in uh, forests like carbon and potassium uh, in in charcoal yeah. in there to create uh, ball lining and to study them. So um, uh, some people say that the the uh, ball lining actually can be um, ca ha capturing microwave energy and it forms a uh, a, a EM mirror within it and uh, the the microwaves can bounce around within it, but. Uh, many many of the Russians uh, dismiss this uh, uh, um, proposal, but it's it's just I, I'm only saying that for context. Um, now the other thing is, do, do you have power lines there as well? Okay, um, now this is uh, I'll answer the question. The answer is the answer to that question isn't as simple as a uh, yes or no, but I'll answer it by saying yes and no because we have here. Uh, we're at the end of the line, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we have what's called uh, earth return power. So the power poles that come from hundreds of kilometres away only have a single wire. Mm -hmm. It's called single wire earth return power. Um, anyone who's not uh, uh, trained in electronics uh, won't. They'll say, "Well, how does the circuit get made?" And you say, "Well, but you know, between the earth and the origin." Uh, but that's that's how it works. Um, there is no high tension lines. There is no big power stations. And you know, I'm uh, lucky to be um, educated and trained not only as an engineer, mm -hmm. but I'm also trained and educated in RF and radio. And some of the first things, if I can, if I can just quickly delve into this uh, with you, um, you know the. 
the first thing I look at is how can I debunk these lights? How can <clears throat> all these lights be explained? There is no radar stations anywhere nearby, uh, whether civilian, military, or weather. Uh, there is no high-powered transmitters. Now, if you have like a submarine transmitting station, you can do all kinds of things with, you can create balls of plasma light by having one or two million or, you know, 1.2 megawatts of power. Uh, and and you, you have a few problems with your earthing and you can have all sorts of spurious emission that can present as visible light. There is nothing around here or actually within 300 kilometers the nearest radar is 300 kilometres away. And the way that radar works, um, you know, 8 to 15 degrees above, you know, the horizon, um, it's not producing balls of light out here that uh, hang around my house. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, uh, John Hutchison was able to create a, uh, a plasma ball uh, um, device generator uh, which I included the mm. schematics for. Uh, it was originally published in Electric Spacecraft uh, Journal uh, in 1993. But uh, he had obviously a Tesla coil which is producing radio frequency level uh, oscillations um, <clears throat> in combination with a discharge gap uh, and a magnetic uh, accelerator. So um, th th these things, w w what, what, you know, uh, there's a there's a number of ways that so-called ball lightning phenomena have been created. One is a very simple one, uh, and that is to use uh, um, uh, a um, what, do, what do you call it? A um, uh, two pieces of pure silicon wire and a whole load of uh, nine volt batteries, and you you tap them together, and it creates mm. a a glowing ball. Um, you, you know the way that we're doing something in here. Um, with potassium and uh, uh, carbon uh, from what I th these are what I call um, live uh, elements um, so uh, the two specific ones and I'm going to talk about this more in the presentation later this week for the justification behind these uh, experiments but obviously carbon has one part per trillion um, uh, as uh, carbon 14 and uh, uh, that uh, can be stimulated to um, uh, according to the work of uh, Alexander Parkhamov here, uh, and it's described in this book, both carbon with its 6,700 or whatever it is in the thousands of uh, years uh, half-life um, can be stimulated to produce uh, a beta particle. Uh, uh, and the potassium itself is the second, potassium 40 is the second uh, most unstable um, uh, radionuclide uh, uh, from the primordial soup so I think it has a something like a in the billions of years half-life uh, and this produces in 98 percent of cases uh, a very high energy beta and these can go on to ionize um, uh, gas molecules and uh, there are many different ways uh, um, that ball lightning have been produced one of them by using RF um, <clears throat> but also with spark gaps and so forth um, and just sparking off a piece of silicon where effectively you are ionizing the material and uh, the yeah. Russians have a specific uh, uh, view about how this occurs it actually knocks out the nucleus and you actually have a, a field structure and these field structures cluster together um, now there was a paper that I've also linked to in the Histalin uh, uh, ball lightning blog that I did where in 2001 uh, the Israelis, uh, I think they, they, they did a study uh, where they um, <clears throat> uh, concluded that a ball of lightning could be produced when lightning comes down, goes into the ground, it makes uh, carbon, carbon from trees and, and silicon dioxide into you know, ju just carbon, pure carbon and silicon, and the ball comes up and um, uh, then produces a thing that continues to burn and feed itself uh it's a stable structure because of the the, the uh, torus um but it, it feeds itself by just yeah. burning slowly oxygen in the air now you in all of what you've described here you've not mentioned anything to do with lightning and uh, that is the same with uh, no. the hairstyle and lights 
So you've never seen lightning connected to or in relation to your ball lightning that you've observed? No, no not, not at all. Um, summer, summer is the uh, storm season when lightning occurs. Um, and when we do see the reduced amounts of ball lights in summer, it's <laughs> never in relation to a storm or lightning, unfortunately. So I'm sorry, it's not. No, 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 no it's just data. So... Um, I mean, in in uh, you you don't you you, ha you don't have power lines in your area, is what you're saying. No. Okay. There is no electromagnetic um, source because that's what I first went to. What is producing this, or what man-made thing is helping nature produce this light? And I mean, hey, look, I'm not a physicist. Uh, I don't have a PhD, uh, but I'm pretty sure that it's not anything man-made interacting with natural, uh, you know, uh, energy. So you mentioned. I think. I think. I think that. Uh, sorry, Bob. Go on. Uh, well, the the, the microwave, the, the transmitters for your satellite uh, internet and for those around you will most likely be microwave origin. And and so that is that is a factor oh, yeah. that has to be considered, um, given what you've said. Um, the the uh, why I mentioned power lines is one of the one of the best most recent uh, uh, recordings of a ball lightning mm. was uh, in Russia, and they have m many different camera angles of the same event, so you can see that this is not a fake event, and, and okay. they were they were recorded by other people, but it was on a relatively stormy day when you have an electric differential in in the, the uh, atmospheric yep. column and uh, you mm. also have a, a high powered high free you know a high tension uh, power line and you can see it's basically yeah. coming coming off off that so there, there's a, a, and obviously it's in a city area so the, there's there's a combination of factors there that may may have stimulated that particular production and like i say these things yeah. have been things like this have been made in many many ways i think i'm right in saying that uh, for a period of time um the, the author of this book which is uh, takaaki matsumoto uh he um uh, created some some ball lightning uh, um and he in fact for a period of time thought that it was being caused by uh, ball lightning um in a in a micro scale um but mm. the dry air t tends to be with these technologies very very important and um because it appears to be that you need to have some level of uh, electrical uh, uh charge accumulation uh and uh, when you have moist air you have uh, obviously discharged through the moist air so you you don't get like static electricity uh, on on yeah. uh, uh, moist days, you get it on dry days, yeah. and so um, this is why Tesla went to uh, the the desert. This is why um, Henry Murray worked in the desert, um, and, and so forth. And and these technologies who are trying to synthesize these things tend to work better in a, a dry environment. So these these are all important factors. Um, now, from my point of view. Um, uh, uh, the 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 whole sort of burning carbon and silicon which seem to be uh, uh, taken on board by um, the the naval research laboratory uh, when it was discussed uh, in 2000 and this is a theory uh, by uh, uh, Abrahamson and Dennis um, they 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 they're interesting yeah. uh, again they used uh, microwaves and silicon to create these uh, visually uh, similar phenomena. Um, but it doesn't mm. explain um, uh, how um, uh, you you get these in the kind of environments that you're talking about. So my my thing that I would look for uh, is um, an area where there are combination of um, mm -hmm. quartz materials and highly conductive metals. Um, and the, the, the reason I say that is because uh, you have the piezo effect of the quartz uh this creates yes. a spark so like when you when you have a lighter that has a piezo lighter yeah. it tends to have a or one for your gas uh, stove these tends to have a crystal in there and you stress the crystal beyond a certain point and it emits a spark yeah. now 
Um, the spark, uh, according to a guy called Kenneth Radford Shoulders, and Kenneth Radford Shoulders, um, he uh, is the person that invented the masking technology for microelectronics. So the fact that we're able to have this call uh, at all is due to Kenneth Radford Shoulders. He mm. also developed uh, the quadrupole mass spectrometer. So the way we actually analyze things that may or may not have been transmuted in our research is because of the work of Kenneth mm. Radford Shoulders. So um, he, okay. he looked at the work of John Hutchison and he went back to the work of, of uh, uh, some people that were working on what was obviously Tesla technology, but expanding it to try and find out ways of making the hydrogen bomb into a useful energy source. Um, uh, and they were using high tension, uh, uh, very high DIDT. This is very fast release of that electricity um uh, discharges mm -hmm. and they produced uh, these plasma balls uh, that could then cluster in various ways and persist for a, a reasonable amount of time uh, and this okay. work uh, was um, uh, i i believe extended by a guy called paul collock uh, who patented uh, in 1973 um, a, a technology for making this and typically they would use an ionizing source this could be a radioactive source it could be uh, rf it could be uh, some uh, any any means like a discharge or a glow discharge something to ionize and this affects the air and so you know ionized air is the kind of thing you, you might consider you're getting on a static day if you know what i mean so these these things are yeah. all correlating so if you've got large temperature changes uh, and you have uh, compression of quartz the quartz will emit these things now every single time you get a spark every single time shoulders established that you will get these things called exotic vacuum objects and this is where you get a a, a, a static field of electrons and and then you have a discharge through it and it causes a uh, a, a a torus to form and the torus then um uh, self clusters and pinches down on itself and then it becomes extremely stable and those things themselves mm. can then go into uh, anything that can carry uh, uh, that, that is like metallic and, and the more conductive it is the more it will take on board this uh, these structures and they will stay in there indefinitely and they will build and they will build and they will build so I have um, materials here that have been affected uh, with the the Hutchison effect, uh, which essentially is uh, using RF and so on to build uh, and distort these things, and these things are highly magnetic. So you get you tend to get metals shearing apart or, or uh, um, uh, other metals uh, twisting like this, and this this happened cold, and so um, uh, you actually in in this sample I have here. We have a uh, uh, ball lightning was appearing on these points of this steel. This is from uh, 1986, I think. Uh, and they were appearing on this uh, steel and they were burning these holes through here with little plasma balls that were appearing. Again, in a cold environment using uh, um, static uh, 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 electricity, electromagnetic fields and, yeah. and discharges. So... So the the, the way uh, and uh, the Russians. Uh, so one 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 researcher we worked with from London, uh, he had a reactor and it was just using heat and it was using heat cycling. Uh, it was it has a quartz tube in it. Uh, we call it the line reactor, um, and uh, it has uh, copper windings in there. It has diamonds. Diamonds are the world's best, especially if they're crappy diamonds I call them, uh, diamonds that are doped with say nitrogen, i.e. industrial diamonds, uh, they are the best electron emitters and this whole thing had a, a high frequency oscillation in it and heat uh, yeah. and heat cycling and this is cr compressing and expanding and compressing expanding you get the electron emission and then periodically you'll get a discharge and you'll get the forming of these evos and the evos can then be in a dark mode this is when the ball lightning is black and you don't see it i it's it, it's it's not yeah. ionizing the air around it to produce light and then it yeah. can then it can shift into a different mode where it's ionizing the air around it and it it, it, it has a glow um and 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 it, in fact <laughs> depending on its its level of intensity it can ionize literally anything <laughs> anything 
Um, yeah. Uh, and so um, uh, what you have is a, a series of observations here where you, you create these things either uh, technologically or, yeah. or naturally yeah. and they get stored into metals. Now, what will happen is, in, in my understanding, is um, that, and this was my argument about the Hestalen lights, and I'm, I'm interested to do, or maybe you could look into this, the comparison between the most predominant times in which they observe things in Hestalen and when you do, and the temperature variation, because the sort of temperature variations you're talking about um, between the sort of uh, mid, mid-teens and down to around about five you know, four or five degrees in, in yeah. th- those yeah. win- winter transitions between day and night may be yeah. quite similar to what's going on in Hestalen. Now, Hestalen has uh, copper and quartz and other minerals yeah. there. So for me, it, in your case, the, the copper is, uh, I think, the second most conductive element. Uh, silver is the most conductive element. So the fact that you have silver there and, and quartz is, is very interesting. The other th- very interesting thing is that um, the way you create cloudy quartz is if you take a quartz crystal and you heat it up, uh, you, uh, I think it's to six or 700 degrees, uh, you then expose it to, to beta radiation from, say, cobalt-60. You can actually make it cloudy. So it could be the fact that your, your quartz in your area and, and, and the beta particle or the exotic vacuum objects can go in. And in the Lion reactor, the clear quartz, fused quartz, it's a similar material to this. This is fused quartz, can go up to 1700 degrees without uh, coming soft. If, if we were to heat this up and then expose this to exotic vacuum objects, yeah. these electron clusters that I'm talking about, these toroids of condensed electrons, this would turn this yeah. cloudy. Now, obviously, you're accelerating yeah. the process by heating it up and then exposing it to the to the to the form of radiation. Um, if you yeah. were to, to do this over millennia, uh, it would maybe be a process that would still occur at lower temperatures, but with a lot slower cycling. So it could be that the cloudy quartz that you're finding in your environment there is as a result of um, the the same structures that then cluster when you have peak yeah. temperature changes and peak compression of the quartz, because the quartz will then emit the, most of these things, uh, and then they yeah. can come out into the environment and, and, and so forth. So um, it, I, I actually suggested, I think, in this document that you may look for uh, highly conductive metals uh, in regions of uh, high lightning and ball lightning uh, uh, environments now i think the the mm. highest um intensity of lightning in the entire world is around the lake uh, where most of the oil comes from in venezuela and if you look around that there oh. are very many mines for uh, um uh, highly conductive metals um so uh, I, I actually proposed that this might be a way where you look for, uh, you know, you actually <laughs> go prospecting for. So uh, it, it doesn't surprise me that you have yeah. silver there. It doesn't surprise me that, that, that you have quartz because this is how you technologically create this phenomena. <laughs> Um, okay, and uh, and I think that probably your microwave transmitters in your environment are um, uh, accelerating the production of these balls where where the energy would be in the air um uh at these times so so if you can imagine you've got your quartz uh and it's got a a, a lot of this build up of energy in the quartz and in the metals around it but when you get down to that four degrees the water mm-hmm. in all of the rock um gets to its maximum uh uh, uh volume um and it's putting ma- maximum pressure on on the uh, quartz then you're effectively mm. you're doing what you're doing in a, an electric lighter to to get it to spark yeah. and if this happens on mass over a large area uh this is putting out a phenomenal number of exotic vacuum objects into the environment these things are high they attract each other <laughs> and you can see this and i, mm. I i've got a, a video on our channel where I, i've done a a, a, a hydrodynamic analog it was from a researcher called Suhas Ralka in India, and he used ultrasonics in a in a, a, a water column, and you can see these things, these toroids, yeah. and they come together. And I don't know if you <clears throat> have seen this, where 
uh, you have one, one maybe in ball lightning where you have one here and one here and as it comes towards this thing it's not a consistent um, it, it, it seems to be this one's traveling at this speed but this one accelerates into it to, to merge with it have you seen something similar to that? Um, I've certainly seen them merge together where, where two, whether there be two or, or more, but ultimately where two have merged together, absolutely, yeah, I've seen where they've they've crashed into each other and then they just go out usually. Yeah, so yeah. if you look at this, it's called Sprites, it's on our channel, if you look for Sprites, um, look at, study what you're seeing there and, and, and see if you it kind of rings true. And effectively, it, these torus of rotating fluids um and in the case of the exotic vacuum object the fluid at least in one part uh, but not necessarily all of it uh, is uh, electrons uh they they pinch down on themselves and because they they make a magnetic structure then they they can cl cluster and come together but depending on mm -hmm. you know uh the uh, the environment around them they 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 will get locked into positions or move with with you know fields mm. that are available in the environment. So it might be. So that you're, you're you're suggesting you're suggesting uh, possibly that uh, microwave transmitters could be, in some cases, the catalyst that helps uh, to get these lights to emerge. Um, is that what? Is well, that well, what, firstly, uh, the with the <clears throat> so firstly, in the cosmos, uh, there is um, uh, one of the most prevalent molecules in the cosmos is uh, OH, uh, the hydroxide, hydroxyl or whatever it is group OH, not H two O, OH, and this uh, yeah. this um, uh, molecule self mazes, and this produces microwave emissions. So periodically the environment will be uh, exposed to microwaves from the environment okay so yeah. whether whether you've got a transmitter there or not so uh, yeah. we know that the that we are able to create what looks like ball lightning and appears to be able to transmute elements from one to the other which is the signature of ball lightning so natural ball lightning yeah. when you look at it the the, the chinese when they did manage to capture a, a natural ball lightning in a high frequency spectrometer you can look at this on wikipedia they observe these several elements and and some of the elements are the same elements like iron and i think calcium uh, you could argue that they're in the ground but if the ball lightning appears in the air where is the iron and the calcium coming from but you can synthesize these uh, in low energy nuclear reactions yeah. the re reason calcium is so common is because it's the it's double magic it's 2020 uh, the predominance uh, uh, ca calcium uh, and uh, it uh, uh, whether you're fusioning or fissioning uh, it likes to go to calcium. So we, we've produced calcium or the, the low energy nuclear reaction field has produced calcium uh, both apparently from well, fusioning and fissioning. You know, uh, you, you, you mentioned you mentioned calcium. I mean, this basalt uh, uh, upper crust basalt we're sitting on is sitting on top of a massive limestone uh, uh, in, intrusion. And of course, what's limestone? Uh, you know, CaCO3, calcium carbonate. You know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I think what's going to happen. Uh, as as this understanding of this, uh, the way this electromagnetic thing uh, can operate and what it can do is people are going to have to really start th rethinking how certain minerals and, and deposits of things formed. Um, uh, you know, it, it looks like biology can do this. So they've shown that both in the lab with the chemicals and also in the lab with with bacteria and yeast and, and glucose, you, you can get, uh, um, and, and even with chickens, uh, with uh, Kervran's work in, in the 1950s, I think it is, Kervial, I can't, I can't remember his name particularly, but the French guy, he showed that if you, you had chickens and they had no calcium in their diet, they would produce soft, just uh, shellless eggs. But if you gave them uh, potassium, they would produce hard eggs. Now his uh, 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 observation yeah. was, that the potassium was getting a, a proton and it was going through to uh, uh, calcium and then it was building the shells. Uh, and this has yeah. been shown 
like I say, with bacteria, it's been shown with seeds, it's been shown with chickens, and it's been shown without any biology. Um, now, th there is a question as to whether it's actually literally just that simple. It might be potassium-40 is going to calcium-40, uh, uh, and uh, uh, you then have uh, this uh, emission uh, of this... Uh, let's get this right... Uh, yeah, I'm just I just need to check my, check my maths on that. <laughs> I don't want to say something that's not true. <laughs> uh, I was check, mm. check, checking my things there. So we have we have a table uh, which you can study, um, <clears throat> and it's uh, mm. it, yeah. So it's, it, potassium forty goes to calcium forty because uh, 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 it gains a proton by emitting a beta particle. Um, and so, but the potassium forty is only a small percentage of um, calcium. Uh, uh, sorry, potassium forty is only a small percentage of uh, potassium. However, if you've got water in the environment, you could you could then have some sort of a nucleon exchange reaction, which also takes it to uh, calcium. Uh, but it's it's the the uh, the potassium forty that triggers that, and uh, actually. I came to this conclusion before I translated Alexander Parkhamov's book, where he also says in his book that potassium-40 may be the fuel of the future. And what I didn't say earlier is that potassium-40 is um, the second most unstable radioisotope after uranium-235 in the universe. Um, <clears throat> so if you okay. had a technology that was able to uh, decay from one atom to another, which is what nature wants to do, the reason... The reason it decays is because it's what it already wants to do. And what you're doing is you're stimulating the, product, the, the, the process of that decay. And it would appear that exotic vacuum yeah. objects, because of what's going on inside them, is able to precipitate that decay process. And so uh, it would appear that biology has learned to do this a very, very long time ago, and it, that potentially it can get a vast mm. amount of energy, uh, but at one atom at a time, as it needs it, to then create elements that it needs out of the available elements in its environment um, so that life can build what it needs for life if you know what I mean it's 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 a, a virtuous yeah. cycle um, but it's actually using potassium uh, as its food and the the view the view of doing this the uh, part of our research and doing this is that if we can demonstrate that you know, carbon 14 which is created in the atmosphere by uh, 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 cosmic rays uh, making yeah. nit nitrogen 14, which is 78% of the air you're breathing right now, convert to carbon yeah. 14. Uh, that takes 6,700 years. If, if we can then put some charcoal into this reactor, put it into the microwave, create our ball lightning and stimulate that because ball lightning, it would appear, is these exotic vacuum objects, but in a cluster of clusters, um, that that can then stimulate mm. the decay of the carbon 14 we, which is at 6,700 years or whatever, and uh, the, the potassium-40 is at, say, 1.2, 1.5, whatever it is, billion years, every single beta isotope between those two should also be able to be uh, uh, triggered to decay artificially within uh, um, the, the same makeup of reactor. And why this is important is to deal with places like yeah. Inuitak Atoll in the South Pacific, where the nuclear testing was done, is to deal with Fukushima in situ, it's to deal with, uh, um, uh, mm. um, what is it, uh, um, uh, Chernobyl. Because Chernobyl's got a real problem with a chlorine isotope, which um, uh, has a, something like a 300,000 year half-life. Um, because of the RBMK design, where they had a lot of carbon moderator, um, the, the uh, uh, most nuclear uh, reactors have a big problem um, with waste, and the the, the pr principal waste from uranium two thirty five uh, is where it splits, kind of like it splits in a curve that's kind of like this, <laughs> has two peaks, and a lot of the the peaks either side of the center split is strontium-90 and cesium-137. And both of these have a, a half-life of around about 30 years, but they're both beta isotopes. And so 30 years is is a lot, 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 lot less uh, at time than 6,700 years, and even much more less than 1.2 billion years. So if you can uh, yeah. immediately 
transmute those materials into stable isotopes, nitrogen 14 and, and, potassium, and calcium 40, then you could take the the cesium 137, the barium, uh, uh, sorry, the cesium 137 and and the strontium 90, and you you transmute those into stable elements by doing their natural decay, but doing it instantaneously because they want to do it much more than even carbon 14 wants to do it. So it should happen basically yeah. instantaneously. So that is that is the purpose of this. But what I'm saying is that we're using microwaves. The Kapitza suggested it was microwaves. Other researchers have said microwaves. And, and also uh, Hutchison is using microwaves and, and uh, um, uh, uh, the, the Israelis were using microwaves. So microwaves do create this effect. Uh, and so given the fact that your transmitters are uh, um, of almost certainly microwave origin, um, they could be stimulating what is a natural process. There's no doubt about this. Long before anyone developed microwaves, there were, you know, microwaves in the environment uh, created by these OH groups in the cosmos. And you would have get, got various times of years when these were higher prevalence than others. But then it's about having all the connect, connections together. You know, a cicada only comes out when all the, the conditions are right. You'll only see a May bug flying in May. Why? Why is it flying at that time? That's a whole other subject, but it's all related to this phenomena. Why is, um, why is, uh, uh, why do many beetles fly when it's dry and it's, it's warm and it's a certain uh, uh, time in the season? Nature is telling you that there are optimum conditions, um, but you still need an environment where you have the baseline uh, uh, things met. And from, from my point of view, yeah. it looks like uh, some type of piezo material, most likely quartz, and some type of highly conductive uh, uh, material, and then a, a high temperature swing uh, 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 in a dry air environment. And these are all things. Yeah, okay. Yep. These are all things that yeah, fit. I, I, can, I can pretty much follow what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you, yeah. but you, you will still have a natural occurrence of these. You know, people have been reporting ball lightning for three, four hundred years, and uh, St. Elmo's fire yeah. and whatever, long before people were using microwaves. But there are still natural microwave emissions. Uh, I think even the oceans produce microwaves. <laughs> you know, so. Um, uh, these things are there, and it might it might be that the the, the um, so somehow the the piezo em emissions or the, the the shifting in the rock or whatever the temperature variations stimulate microwaves from the from the water in the ground. I don't know that, that that's just speculation at that point, but we know we can create this technologically. We know it has the same transmutations as looks like you can get from a spectral emission from an actual ball lightning, and. Uh, uh, you know, it's it's an electrical phenomena. Uh, it's a, an electrical cluster phenomena, uh, and therefore, as it's electro uh, an electron structure, we know that fields and magnetics can manipulate it. So it would be interesting to see whether the basalt. I, I know it's. I don't know whether it's magnet. It's not magnetite or whatever. There are certain uh, types of rock that are, uh, are you know, well, more magnetic than others. Well, I need to. I need to just, um, you know, as we get further into this in more depth. Now, this area is not known for iron uh, or iron production, uh, you know. But uh, in every piece of milky quartz that you pick up, you can see along every fracture and fissure, uh, you know, every every part of the rock, um, you can see that there is iron oxide. <laughs> Any piece of quartz you pick up, okay, um, there'll be iron oxide All right. uh, on along one edge. Yeah, yeah. So it, to make it to make it simple, what I'm saying is, if you get if you do find a big chunk of um, milky quartz, if you were to bash it onto another rock and split it in half because it breaks quite easily, you'll see that the faces of uh, the faces all have a, uh, a, a a coating of iron oxide. Every, every one. It, it's quite common. So I, I'm sorry that I left that out. No, I don't know it, if that was you know what? It's important that you did leave it out. <laughs> yeah, 
you, you know what I'm saying in terms of the yeah. looking through the, through through the evidential pattern. So I think I think really uh, now have you been able to capture these things on film? No, the the most embarrassing thing for me and for us is that over many years, no one in the district, no one in this area seems to have got any video or, or still photograph of it. I have tried, even when they've been flying around me and they're three or 400 metres away illuminating the ground, you try and take a photo. And by the time, because I've got a digital camera, by the time you try and uh, press the button, the bloody thing moves, um, you know, and goes out. And, I mean, we've really tried to take photos, and we've tried taking photos from far away, uh, from other hilltops, where we, we might be, say, 20 kilometres away at the same uh, altitude, looking back at my farm in this area, and we take photos, and then, of course, then they don't come out. So, uh, you know, I'm really sorry and embarrassed that okay, so let's... Years we haven't got them. Let's fix that. I mean, everyone recognizes that these transient phenomena, uh, you know, and, and unless you're obsessive compulsive and are willing to sit on a hilltop uh, and, and, you know, try and find your, your Afghanistani snow tiger uh, shot you, you, <laughs> with, with your, your super yeah. duper lens, you're never going to see it, right? So um, it, it takes a certain uh, a special dedication and, and you, you are obviously in a remote location, so these things are not easy to do. However, um, at Hestalen, they, they recognized that they needed to get better footage uh, of these things that obviously people were seeing. And so they set up automated uh, system for capturing these. I'm going to describe to you right now uh, how you can do this uh, relatively simply. It doesn't okay. need to cost a fortune, but maybe you can put together some sort of a, a funding request and maybe we could f facilitate that to be funded. I don't know. Um, you know, we, we have a lot to do, but uh, um, essentially you can mm -hmm. buy um, webcams like the one that I'm talking to you on right now. Um, for yeah. uh, reasonable sums of money. In fact, you can get uh, high definition yeah. ones, but um, uh, this one is a 1080p camera. Uh, you can get ones at uh, mm. so-called 4K, which is just quad resolution of here. It's not technically 4K, but anyway, mm. they call it 4K. Um, but uh, you, can, you can get these and you can plug it into a, a, a PC. It doesn't need to be a particularly powerful one, uh, even a laptop. Uh, and you can run a piece mm -hmm. of software uh, called ManyCam. And what ManyCam will do is you can have multiple cameras. It's called ManyCam for a reason. So you want a, a laptop that's affordable, doesn't need to be super duper, uh, um, uh, with a, a yeah. number of USB 2 ports on it. Uh, that's the key thing. Or you can mm -hmm. get a, a powered adapter. But it's simpler if you just make it, you know, with a basic, um, uh, just yeah. with, a, with, with a laptop that has multiple ports. Um, yeah. But let's say you don't, and you can get a cheaper option with 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 a laptop and and a, a powered USB adapter. Then what you do is you plug in four of these cameras, and you either point them in a kind of like semicircular array, and and then what you do is you set up mm -hmm. software where it's running twenty four seven, and as soon as it detects motion, it starts making a video. And what okay. it can do is it can send you an email. I think it can even send you a, an SMS. Um, it can record that and then you use a, a piece of software called Super Flexible File Synchronizer, syn synchronizer I think something like that and it can look into yeah. a directory and as soon as there's a file that's been saved there it can upload it to a public shared drive now what you would do then is you would have multiples of these units at your location and maybe those of other people who are let's say you, you've got a spot here and you live here, yeah. another person lives here, and another person lives here. You set up three of these yeah. uh, sites, and you 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 have them recording and all send, sending to a repository, uh, 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 which mm. is automatically updated. And, and then you can get mm. triangulation. And so you know it's the same event. It's recorded from multiple angles. You, you can know which yeah. direction it's going in, what the actual geometry is, because you can work out from the different angles if there is some sort of structure going on. And mm. I think this would be an amazing study, and I think there would be great interest in doing it. Yeah, well, I'm I'm certainly interested in pursuing it. I mean, I contacted um, Erling Strand um, mm. uh, some years ago, and uh, he ended up telling me uh, 
that uh, the local university in Australia would be in touch, and uh, they never have been. Uh, so I'm I'm interested in uh, getting. Uh, uh, I mean, I don't want publicity or to become famous. I would like some genuine scientific study so that we can figure this out because I think, I mean, I don't think it's probably going to be the answer to the Earth's, um, you know, uh, energy needs. I don't think it's going to result in, you know, interstellar space travel. Uh, but I think I think we can figure it out with some genuine science so and my, my, my view thinking. on these things is don't wait for someone else to do it for you. <laughs> you know, I, I was given this book in 2015 in, Jan, in January or February uh, in, in Moscow by Alexander Parkamov, and it was in Russian. And I thought, I really want to read this. I really, really want to read this. And um, I got to the point of going, I'm never going to be able to read this and un understand where he's coming from with these amazing experiments that I know he's done. Um, unless yeah. I, I get it translated. So I did a Kickstarter last year, raised the money in about five days, and uh, found tra I'd already found a translator. I'd worked out how to do everything. Um, and, uh, you, you know, the, uh, um, did it, and now this is out. And, and, and people, you know, at NASA and on the Sapphire project here, this is the, uh, the Sapphire project. Yeah, they are replicating, uh, uh, or at least they have equipment that seems to replicate the the way the sun mo uh, actually does its work. Uh, here, here's uh, some their anode, uh, and uh, they 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 they've uh, uh, re referred to this uh, and so forth, and it, it's making a real difference. So uh, you cannot prejudge what the information will spawn in terms of understanding. Um, so uh, certainly, uh, I, I can tell you that uh, w when that report came out in uh, 2000 or 2001 uh, about the, 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 the Israelis' understanding of what ball lightning might be, you know, the US Navy research labs came out and said, we've been studying this, we're very interested in, we've been w trying to work out what it does for years. As I said, the research, the, the Russians have been calling their cold, new trans cold nuclear transmutation and ball lightning. They've been calling it that for, you know, essentially uh, all of the time they've been studying it uh, uh, since uh, the, the late uh, 1980s. So um, they, they did work before then, but they, they re-engaged with it at that time and they've been calling it that since. And so, um, you know, having high quality data and, and there's almost technologically no excuse for not capturing that now because you don't have to watch it 24 7 and you're actually coming into the time of year if i'm not wrong because i have family living in in That's melbourne correct. um when you might see an uptick in this this activity so i yes, i would imagine yes, yes. i would imagine probably a suitable laptop you you could even buy secondhand ones for maybe a hundred and two hundred aussie dollars that would be suitable it doesn't need to be fantastic uh the cameras would maybe be around about a, the you would want at least the camera that i'm talking to you on now because you want the resolution you want to be able to see something at a distance and track yeah. it over a good number of pixels with a fair pixels exposed um, so I would suggest a, a 1080p or a, ideally a 4K camera. And a, a license of this software for a year is not expensive. Um, you would need a, a package license, which again is not expensive, and it's on a yearly basis. Um, and th then yeah. if you buy one of these packages, I think they can... I'll, I'll look at it now, but uh, what is it? Uh, um, they are, have got... You can, uh, oh, well, there you go. So 79 US dollars for a year. You can run three devices and each device can have 24 video sources at 4K quality. So um, you just need base, basically three laptops. Uh, I would suggest... I would suggest enough cameras to look in every direction and it, it monitors the camera. When it sees a motion, it then records the video. Um, and you use this super so flexible does, file synchronizer. Does it call motion light? I mean, are they interchangeable when you say motion? I understand it's, it's looking motion at your detection. frame of reference. So let's say I was looking at this room behind me, and that's what it so sees. So it changes. Yeah. Right? That's what it sees. And it'll turn the camera on when it sees that, and it'll inform you that it's turned the camera on. So it, they've done it okay, for like okay. a security system. 
So what you do is you, you, you could maybe um, schedule it in some way, and I'm sure there's a way to do this, uh, so that it's, ba it's basically looking at the sky. And um, you, you can get super flexible file synchronizer to delete or ignore things that uh, are written into a directory uh, between a certain time of day. So you could say anything up to six o'clock, you're going to delete using this software, super flexible file synchronizer. Right, so it's only going to look at uh, um, recordings which included a, a new motion state uh, over, yeah. say, seven o'clock in the evening. So yeah. a, a, anything that's recorded before then will be ignored on every day, and it will be cleaned out of the directory. Yeah. So even if a bird flies across, or someone's throwing a ball, and it captures in the camera, or there's a plane, or whatever, you know, those are going to be ignored. Yeah. Um, and you, you know yeah. clouds or whatever you, you're just going to be wanting to turn turn this recording on from this period to this period and and uh, um, and then you upload those to the cloud and so they're not going to be lost because computer failed or whatever else so yeah. you could you could design a, a really robust system to capture these things which is working not 24 7 but certainly for 24 365 <laughs> because yeah, well, you're, you're only interested in that that period between six and ten or yeah. whatever um and, yeah, and then, uh, then it's hands free yeah okay well um the only challenge there is uh the uh leaving it out in the weather so we have to well, you, well, you weatherproof would, it but... you would mount it in your house i mean what what they did in in uh Hest Island is they built a hut because it, it, there was no one living there but you're saying that there's several people that live in and around the area. And ideally, you would want to yeah. find three people that you could triangulate, you know, an area of land. Okay. Yeah, okay. I mean, I, I mean that, that uh, the big one that landed on the ground uh, or, or, you know, that I chased after with the uh, vehicle, um, you know, I saw that from the house. But to see most of these, we have to go up on some of the hill or any of the hills uh which are nearby so uh you know uh we just have to uh, overcome that small challenge of trying to uh, weatherproof something like this but it can be done yeah so i mean uh and you can run these cameras you know on a, on a five meter lead so you can you can put the cameras up on a pole if you have to um uh mm. if you need to get above a tree line or something in a, in a particular area yeah, no, that's that's installation's not a problem. It's just uh, uh, weatherproofing it. That's all because it does rain in Australia from time to time. Believe it or not. Well, you just yeah, like I say, you you, you create a, almost like a fish tank with with a hood on it. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. As you're saying, it's it's mostly the drier, uh, less humid time of year when these things occur. So that that's optimal from a point of view of protecting these devices um so it, it, it needn't it needn't you know an upturned fish tank would probably be enough <laughs> with a camera you know a couple of cameras pointing even a fish tank that was maybe let's say hexagonal or octagonal and and then you put a camera on each face um and okay. so you're basically able to view you, you would look at the field of view of the camera and if it's got a 60 degree field of view yeah. then then you, you you know you can put uh uh six six of those or whatever it is uh around the great, the great thing is is that because of the centralized nature of these lights uh and and my farm just by chance being the epicenter of the activity the great thing is i can i can get three 60 degree cameras because uh, i only need to see 180 degrees so that, that's quite achievable. Okay, so yeah, so the, these cameras typically have a fairly wide field of view. I think some of them are even 90 degrees. So you only need two <laughs> to, to cover 180 yeah. degrees. Um, but I, I would suggest, yeah. uh, you know, having the higher resolution ones um, because if these things are very bright contrast to the, the, to the sky, yeah. then, then uh, you, you want more pixels and, and and you can run the recording at 30 or 60 frames a second so when it starts recording you'll have a lot of uh, um, time resolution on on the the actual activity of the device 
Um, and then yeah. what you want is to have, and in ManyCam, you can overlay onto the video, say, for instance, the UTC with a semi-transparent, so you you don't lose yeah. spatial resolution if, if, the, if the ball lightning goes underneath the camera stamp. And then if you have multiple yeah. sites where these are, then... Um, uh, uh, they're they're all timed to UTC, so you can uh, time sync them together, and you can also time sync yeah. them from a particular movement. But uh, and once you've got triangulation, then you then you can actually look at say a satellite image of your land with with a, a, a displacement map on it, so you can make a virtual landscape, and you can actually then exactly move look at the the, the motion that it made in in all three. Uh, dimensions uh, and get get mm. accurate scale. So the, the, these things that you can do by triangulation will be possible. And, you know, it, yeah. I, I think it would be a fantastic study. And and don't don't wait for someone else to do it for you. you know, if you want me to help you, you know, do the fundraiser or or, or whatever, or put the package of information together so that, that you can do it, um, then uh, we can talk further. But uh, I think you've got a real yeah, opportunity sure. here. If, if, if and I, w I wouldn't miss it. You know, how how many months are we we're starting to get into the winter now? And the peak time is from when to when? Uh, yeah. It's from when to when? Oh, April to September. Okay, April so great. Let, <clears throat> I, I would suggest that you know you you get on this. We get on this pretty quick, and. Uh, you know your your ability to have discussions with people that are interested in this field will be orders of magnitude higher uh, when when you've got data and and I think by taking this approach <laughs> when, when you when you when, when you take this approach I think having having the the spatial thing th th this is what was so awesome about that video that was taken in Moscow because independent people took it from independent uh you know multiple locations yeah. so you can it's something you yeah. can scientifically study <laughs> um but um, you, these yeah. things are freak most of the time but you're saying that you're seeing these many times in, in that months so and, and hard drive space is oh, not yeah. expensive and once it's uploaded to the cloud you know you can you can have the public look at them and and you you will be amazed. <clears throat> there will be people out there that will do the work for you of triangulating this. <laughs> yeah, you know what? You, and, and 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 it'll be done because it's so really. You're interested in it. I can tell you, you're not the only one. There are hundreds of thousands of people that are very interested in this. So you know you've mm. got a unique opportunity here. So I, I think I think don't don't wait for someone else to do it for you. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, we can move forward from from that. Yeah. Uh, you know. Um, and uh, have you have you had much contact with many other people in Australia? Uh, uh, I mean, uh, how how much more activity is there uh, that you know about in in, in Australia? Uh, is there yeah. much activity? Uh, I I I have not really studied this as you know the, the study of ball lightning is more for me. Uh, how it's occurring, um, uh, uh, and, oh, okay, yeah. and you know, I'm, yeah. I'm not been studying bull lightning around the world. Although, if you if you look in my blog, uh, I've actually linked to studies that have looked at sites of bull lightning around the world. So, um, you know, th this that kind of work has been done. But I, the 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 t type of study that I'm proposing to you, and, and the other thing is, is that if you capture one of these things quite closely. Um, mm. You can actually, I, th I think, I believe, I'm right in saying is that you can actually look at the spectral information from that to a certain degree, um, so you can understand mm. maybe what elements are in there. I suspect it would be something similar to uh, what was observed in in the the Chinese capture, um, but um, you know, I I I, I, uh, I think you, you really there's only a few places in the world where I've heard of this kind of level of activity. And so you you've got to be getting on top of it. And once once you, you, you know, go on. Yeah, uh, you know, statistically, the the thing the the thing that's um that that's um, at loggerheads with this is that we've got no evidence, but we I think statistically uh, see more of these things than any other place. I've never heard. Uh, I mean, look, I haven't done. 
uh, you know, uh, in-depth research. But, you know, I, I mean, compared to Hestal, we see a thousand times more lights. I mean, when they're on, we'll see 20 one night, 36 the next night, uh, as I as I said before, 72. The, the night we saw 72, um, I think the, not, the day before was 36, uh, the day before was 20. Um, I think the night after 72, uh, it might have been 15 or, or, or 40. Uh, you know, we, we are statistically seeing more of these things up close, uh, you know, than, than anyone. And, and, and the thing is, is that I'm not the first person who's tried to reach out. Um, you know, other people have tried to reach out and, and uh, you know, none of us have got anywhere. So, you know... We'll, we'll see what happens. With, do it, with, with do, me. It, do, do let, let, let's do this. So um, I, th- I think it's suitable for Kickstarter. I think that uh, um, y- y- what, what you have to do with the Kickstarter is you have to deliver. Uh, there's, there's no two ways about it. So I, I think the most important thing that you could do now, right now, I, I, I can deal with the, the software and the systems integration and what's needed and at what level. Um, and I, yeah. I can trial it uh, um, and, and make sure it all works as a, as a concept. Um, uh, yeah. What you need to do is to uh, find out how you can run power to suitable locations that can be uh, act as triangulations on a, a sample area that where you would expect to see a good number of these items. Uh, yeah. And then we would work to put together a proposal that would basically be open and shut. You know, th- this study is going to do this. Uh, this is what we're going to use. These are the tools. These are the people that are going to be doing the work. And um, if if you are giving something that is able to give back to a community of interested persons, like this gave back to the people that were interested in supporting it, there are a very large number of people out there that are interested. It doesn't take a lot of ten pounds. Uh, donations uh, you know before uh, um, you can achieve something amazing as a collective group Um, so yeah I can't help you uh, with knowing where the best locations are to site a unit and how you would get I I, I can deal with that that's easy for me and then then how you would get I'm, I'm, I'm happy to spend my own money to kick this off um, I mean, I, I certainly don't want to appear to be doing this to get a free free software or free computer or whatever. I, I, I'm happy to uh, kick this off myself, get some evidence, and then say, okay, this is what I've ca- I finally captured something. Uh, you know, obviously there'll be some orange lights in the sky. Um, I mean, then then we can ramp up and say, you know, because what I'd, what I'd be afraid of is you guys – organize all this stuff and maybe spend x amount of dollars and the cameras go out there and for five months we don't see anything it's like you'll go oh bloody hell you know there's there's no lights you know this guy's <laughs> this guy's been bullshitting you know okay so you know, so well, this, let, let's this, do, this I mean, guy's let's... the same as the one that thinks that bigfoot you know is is, is in the uh, north american uh, forest you know it's, it's the same approach i took to this i didn't want to go to the to the international community and say look i, I know i can do this until i knew i could do it so i actually paid uh and, and worked for three months so i actually went out and i interviewed uh, uh tens uh, i think it was 40 m- many 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 philologists translators and i got them to translate parts of it and 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 uh uh you know see how it was i i then tested software and the whole process from you know g- getting the text uh translated all the way through to getting the book published and so i knew 100 percent i could deliver so i think i think what you're suggesting is a good idea um so uh let me look at putting a, a proposal together of the software uh that you need you, you can get a lesser you know you can get a, a standard uh, uh many cam license which does one device and and four video sources uh, hd quality I, I would i would do something better than that but you know we can discuss that offline but um, yeah, so I I, I, yeah. I would do that uh, um, and and maybe get camera. My my concern is if you're absolutely sure that these things are there and they're quite uh, prevalent, uh, that we don't want to be wasting too much time. <laughs> um, yeah, 
you, you know, because you're going to lose a year and you'll lose momentum. Uh, um, so mm. uh, if, if you think that maybe you could capture something in maybe two or three weeks, uh, uh, an example, uh, it does uh, just one camera angle, mm. or you could have two cameras and, and, and space them 10 meters apart. So at least you'll have some, uh, par you know, some yeah. parallax. Uh, you uh, you know if you uh, like I say I run this camera quite happily on a five meter powered USB three cable, and so you could have technically yeah. two cameras ten meters apart, um, yeah. uh, and they could be looking at a pit, pit place where you most likely to see these things, and they'll just continue looking. And if they capture something, you'll have it from two different angles. Uh, that would be very mm. very convincing, mm. and and not cost a lot. Um, uh, and then you. We, oh, we, look! Um, I can I can cite them where where two cameras would capture ninety percent of what has been going on here for decades. Okay, with fantastic. The lights. Yeah. Two, two cameras is all I would need. Uh, I mean, three cameras at sixty degrees would be well the maximum I would need because I can locate them because I know where they are. Mm. The lights are always in front of. The, that point I'm referring to. Mm -hmm. And so h how would you power them, though? That's the question. Oh, well, you know, um, if they're going to sit out in the, in the, uh, on an open hilltop, uh, you know, I would have to get a 12-volt uh, a, a battery and then some sort of converter uh, that runs off 12 volts to run the laptop. Uh, and I guess then the cameras would run off the laptop or, uh, already. So yeah, I mean, uh, it, it, let's say you're talking about a, an 80 watt laptop, and you want it to run for. Uh, I mean, it needs to run continuously. Um, and the the mm. other thing is, you ideally want it to be. Well, at this stage, you don't necessarily need it to be uploading to the internet all time, but it would be ideal if it could. Um, um, but anyway, um, maybe a couple of panels. Well, I mean, I, I had. I had that's four 90-watt panels in, in India for eight and a half years, and uh, I think maybe two 90-watt panels or you know, one, one, one solar panel charging the battery. And then uh, 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 you can get these devices that are they're kind of like for the car. You plug it into the lighter socket, and it has a 240-volt output, you know, and that can power the laptop and the cameras. So, you know, you... Yeah, you would, yeah that's... Yeah. Laptop, laptop, and uh, inverters and converters, easy stuff. Uh, I deal with that stuff all the time. That's I'm easy. sure. I'm sure you do. So I, I would probably recommend about a t 200 watt panels, uh, a 36 volt or, or a, a gang of 12 volt uh, accumulators from cars, uh, preferably new, so that you know what they're going to work. <laughs> and, yeah. and then just a little inverter to to run the. Uh, 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 to run the yeah. laptop, I think. Yeah, I think you're good to go. Yeah. If we if we know the voltage and the current drain, we just use Ohm's law, and yeah. we build a system that's uh, twice as twice as powerful as the maximum that it will ever use. So, Ohm's law, pretty easy. Yeah. 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 Okay. I think I think you're well on your way. So put put together a proposal. I'll 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 look at the uh, technological side here and 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 get that working. I'll run a, run around with an LED in the room, <laughs> and see if it captures and stuff. Yeah. Um, so I, I I can work with that and and uh, once once we've got that first footage, I think I think we'll go out to the public and uh, um, mm. see if we can gain their interest. And you know, um, I, I think. Uh, ideally you want three three locations and then you're going to have wonderful data the, the other thing is that you've got this uh, wireless internet can can you set up uh, um you know some some sort of uh what wireless links between the, the 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 sites because really you want you want you would ideally want this to be uh real time uploaded i mean the the the, the engagement from the crowd it's, it's what I would yeah. want to do, so that, so that, that, that they know, yeah. because you will get people that will sit there on the directory and they will set up their own alert system. So as soon as something is yeah. new that's uploaded, they'll be like, right, what is it? And they'll be looking at it, and you'll you'll end up people. With people okay, to, it'd be exciting. When for it everyone. comes to, yeah, um, that 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 would certainly be exciting, and I'm, I'm sure those people are uh, uh, exist. Uh, you know, again, 
anything can be done. I'm used to uh, using RF and linking things together. It can all be done. Um, you know, it just as you uh, add complexity, you add cost. Uh, yeah. You know, so no, I, I, I think, think in, in the beginning in, in, it's going to be cheap and. Yeah, initially, yeah. It, it just it just set up the three camera or two camera system to to capture your first images, um, and and then work from there. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. We can we can we can start off, and then when things get serious, like oh, okay, right, this is working. We can then think about the cloud and and the internet because where the cameras are going to go isn't within range of the uh satellite internet here at the house yeah yeah you know it's there's some miles away um yeah. obviously my farm's pretty big yeah <laughs> you know so australia's yeah. pretty big <laughs> uh, yeah it is it yeah. is plenty of space um but uh all right okay well um there that's uh that um you know um if you've got any more questions um oh, i'm happy God, to answer uh, them well, I, I think we've been through the kind of uh, the formation. So in summary, um, they blink on and off. Uh, they can separate. They can come together. They can form lines. They, they can form uh, geometric structures uh, up to seven or eight at a time. Uh, they can be from a certain number of meters up to, what, 10 meters, you said, like scale-wise? Um, oh, no, from 10 to 30 meters um in size i right. mean i guess the average is 20 meters right so you know, when they've been when they've been three or four hundred meters from me the light is the size of 20 meters in diameter right right yeah yeah and when they're that close they go from being a ball to just being like a like someone shining a spotlight in your face yeah where you can see the center of the light but you really can't you know, uh, tell uh, everything's covered in light. So my best estimates are uh, 10 to 30 metres because I've seen them at all distances, Yeah. right, from very close to very far. Yeah. And it's all of those observations that have led me to, but mostly the, the, the close ones, that have led me to believe uh, that they're 10 to 30 metres in, in uh, diameter. So what, you, what you're describing you know, is the field area which gets excited but you're saying that when they're very close to you sometimes you see like what might be a core or it, is is that what you're saying yeah okay this is this is interesting when they come on and stay on uh you know for and what i mean is more than four seconds up to a, a few minutes uh, mostly around 30 seconds up to a minute mostly, when they stay still, they are absolutely circular. To look at them, they are in like two dimensions, like you're looking at a, a round circle, and the intensity is exactly the same. When they're very, very close, you can't discern any core. It's just one big, massive, big burning orange light. And you can't necessarily uh, – there, there's no shape. I mean, the first thing I've looked for is like, okay, is there a shape here? What part of it's different? You know, um, they are just a big round uh, blob. But the thing is when they're, when they're stationary and alive, they are absolutely circular. They're absolutely circular. Um, you know, when they're flashing across the sky – like in Hestalen, um, you know, it's just like someone, you know, just turning on a, on a torch, you know, um, you know, and, and depending on how close you are, you know, is, is how, you know, tells you how big they are. And, and obviously yeah. there's the questions which have been raised for Hestalen as well. Uh, you know, what is the number of car movements? Uh, do cars move more? What are the roads in the area? Those kind of questions. Yeah, um, you know, I I look at you know things like, you know, what 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 could this be? You know, I mean the obvious ones. I mean, you know, you get your detractors and your debunkers, and they say, well, you're looking at an aeroplane, or you're looking at a flare. Well, you know, the interesting thing is, the air force don't fly around dropping flares in Australia because they start. Because it's set forest fires. 
and they're never going to do that. Uh, the liability would be in the billions of dollars. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you look at uh, is it helicopters, is it uh, weather balloons, is it a drone, you know, is it a UFO from outer space? No, I don't think it is. Um, you know, um, is it a manifestation of microwave radar from a from a radar station a couple hundred miles away? Could be, but I, in my knowledge of radio and RF, I find it very difficult to go from radar uh, to a ball in the sky. Uh, you know, uh, not 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 mentioning what you talked about because that could be you know something that, uh, that that's quite real uh, in a laboratory sense uh, that you know you're you're duplicating something in a laboratory which could be happening out in nature with the help of microwave it could be but I mean you know the common emitters of microwave RF such as radars I can't see how a radar would do it. Unless there is simply science that we just don't understand, and 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 look, that's probably what it comes down to. We don't understand yet the science. Are, are we going to figure it out? I think we will. I, I think we're very I close think, to figuring it out. Yeah. Um, and, I mean, and I'm not. I'm not uh, so sure it hasn't been figured out. But uh, you know, there's a lot of people that can't be bothered to figure it out because they don't understand it. And and self-sustaining plasma or some sort of uh, mobile ionization source which persists for as you say like maybe 30 seconds into the minutes uh this is just something that is so yeah. beyond what, what plasma physicists uh would generally uh, think is possible in a, in a, a relatively high pressure environment yeah and and the thing is it, it's got to be studied because these things are not going away well they do go away but they come back yeah and and we have to nail it down mm -hmm. um uh, i think you were right initially when you said we can't um arrogantly predict what the outcome of the discovery will be uh because uh it might be really surprising it might be really simple and dull but i, I think there'll be some excitement along the way but when we figure it out, we'll go, ah, oh, okay. And uh, with any luck, maybe we will find a way to create uh, electricity for free. Uh, but at the moment... Uh, well, I, know, I would, I would certainly yeah, yeah, suggest you know, that you look sorry, at yeah. the presentations that I've made with regard to the Paul Collock uh, patents uh, uh, with the... Uh, uh, they're made what they call plasmax and they very carefully describe the structure the electromagnetic structure of them and the fact that they do tend to look spherical or they can they can look at, uh, slightly elongated uh, or uh, ovoid as well sometimes but then they're they're technologically creating these things and so um you know it'd be, it'd be interesting also i'll just go and pop and get it Um, what you can do on ManyCam is um, you can have uh, uh, the cameras looking at various devices and recording like at the same time. So you can, uh, one device I quite like is this, and this is an, an e-smog meter. But what this does is it will tell you uh, a microwave frequency peak. That, like, I, the, the microwave frequency that is producing the most energy in the environment and it will also give you your uh, electrical field and your magnetic field so it has an E field sensor and it may be that uh, between you know the upper atmosphere and the lower atmosphere during these times you might have an electric field potential set up um, and it might be worth uh, looking at what's going on there so I'm just looking at here I'm um, just changing to it's it's volts per meter. I don't know whether it's going to come out. It's not very good at focusing. Yeah. Um, but that that will give you a volts per meter, and it will be interesting to see uh, through the day uh, at this time when you tend to see these peak uh, uh, um, events whether there is a larger volts per meter uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, I, I mean, it's these these kind of 
uh, potential differenti- uh, differentials um, that that are responsible for you know in into cloud lightning, cl- ground to cloud and cloud mm. to ground lightning discharges, and it, it is very yeah. likely I would suspect uh, that there will need to be some tension in the air uh, um, during uh, the initiation of of these uh, uh, ball lightning, mm. uh, and this would be a, a, an affordable. Uh, metric to be able to gather uh, at the same time and like like I say I would also want to um, maybe have a, an extra camera that when when the camera is switched on you you would also capture with a slit and a diffraction grating uh, uh, a diffraction pattern but I think you can do it after you captured uh, but th- then you would be able to get mm-hmm. the spectrum and you will be say able to say this is not a xenon car lamp this is not a sodium lamp. This is a ball yeah. lightning because mm-hmm. it has the same spectrum as the ball lightning that was observed in China, or, or it's a ball yeah. lightning that has this spectrum. Are you with me? So I definitely like to find, I definitely like to obtain that data. Yeah. Um, you know, so that there's no one who can say that uh, that uh, this is something that's not. Yeah. So so what I'm trying to get to is a point where the study will be able to tell us what the field potential is at the time these things occur we would want to monitor what what we we've been doing with our experiments is to live broadcast a lot of factors like you so you can capture relative humidity you can capture temperature you can capture electric field uh, uh, um, per meter uh, and you can through a diffraction grating uh, capture um uh, uh, spectral information so the, the key right now is I think we've established let's capture from a couple of camera angles uh, simultaneously uh, an event at least one event occurring and then these mm. this is the kind of data that that will basically negate the negators <laughs> you know it, it'll debunk yeah. the debunkers uh, and then we can get on to doing some real science so I think uh, I am going to have some lunch now. So I'm going to thank you for your time, Aid. Uh, obviously, you can contact me at any time as, as, as we look to pu- push this forward. Um, do ca- have a look at the experiments that we're developing uh, with the supernova reactor uh, because it is very much in line uh, uh, with uh, the understanding that is emerging on ball lightning. And uh, um, yeah, th- thanks for getting in contact. I'll publish this video and uh, um, you'll be able to review it and uh, run over it as you wish. Yeah, uh, thank you, Bob. And um, uh, thank you uh, to the viewers who've uh, watched uh, this uh, video production. Thanks very much. And remember, much appreciate. <laughs> and remember um, if you have any questions for Aid or myself, please drop them into the video. Uh, and I will endeavour to make sure I have the Hestal and Lights uh, blog link there as well. Uh, So thank you very much for your time, and uh, I'll see you in the next video.